from gaining visibility into the challenges of governing Iraq, and I think as Peter said, many of the challenges that President Saleh pointed to uh, were not really political, right? Or were not geopolitical either, but had a lot to do with um, real issues, societal issues, economic issues, um, uh, issues that, that are very difficult uh, to deal with. Uh, we will next explore another dimension of the Iraqi experience, the experience of American and British servicemen and women and diplomats whose boots were on the ground during the war and who engaged in nation building and nation mending efforts in the war's aftermath. Here to do that are the ambassador of the United States to Qatar, His Excellency Mr. Timmy Davis, and His Excellency Mr. Jonathan Wilkes, UK ambassador to Qatar. Ambassador Davis is a career member of the Senior Foreign Service with the rank of Counselor. Before he joined the Foreign Service, he served in the United States Marine Corps for nearly a decade, including in the Horn of Africa and Iraq. He has been Ambassador to Qatar since August 22. Timmy, you and I both came to Doha to start our new jobs around the same time. Prior to his current appointment, His Excellency served as a diplomat in several locations around the world, including Najaf and Basra in Iraq, where he was Consul General and where he oversaw the suspension of military operations. Ambassador Davis's knowledge of Arabic and expertise in matters concerning Iraq resulted in his positions as Director for Iraq at the National Security Council and Deputy Chief of Staff to the Special Presidential Envoy to counter ISIL. Now, a couple of things about um, Ambassador Davis. As you will find out, he has a phenomenal sense of humor, a very large personality, and I'm very proud to say that he is a constant presence at Georgetown University in Qatar. Uh, yes. <laughs> he loves coming, and our faculty and students love having him. Now, we forgave him for having been the commencement speaker at Texas A&M. Uh, we have the dean of Texas A&M uh, here with us with his wife, Gina. Uh, but we had Ayman Mohiddin, and that's why we sat you next to one another. Ayman was our commencement speaker. Uh, but it, it, I will announce tonight our new um, Ambassador Speaker Series, which will be inaugurated by Ambassador Davis. He's not being taken by surprise because we discussed it at the home of John and Pat Wilkes uh, not long ago. So we will inaugurate the Speaker Series with a talk and um, a lunch and a program with Ambassador uh, Davis uh, to be followed the following month with a talk by Ambassador Wilkes, our other speaker uh, in, the next section, in, in the next session. Uh, ambassador Wilkes has been representing His Majesty's government in Qatar as its ambassador since 2020. He has a long and distinguished record of engagement with the Middle East as an expert and diplomat. Starting from his first position in the Foreign and Commonwealth Sir Office, where he was an assistant desk officer on Iran in the Middle East Department. His subsequent postings included Yemen, Saudi Arabia, and Sudan. Between 2007 and 2009, he was also the regional Arabic spokesman, spokesman becoming a regular guest on Al Jazeera. 10 years later, in 2017, he was appointed the British ambassador to the Republic of Iraq having served already there as the deputy head of mission in Baghdad from 2009 to 2010. His superb diplomatic work was recognized in 2012 when he was awarded the most distinguished order of St. Michael and St. George, a British order of chivalry bestowed on individuals who hold high office and render extraordinary non-military service to the United Kingdom in a foreign country. Now, in January, we will miss John here in Doha because he will be stepping down from his position as ambassador. But we look forward to having him as an academic colleague when he joins the Center for Islamic Studies 
at the University of Oxford. I'm proud to call both gentlemen and their spouses, Patty Davis and Pat Wilkes, friends. Now, both of these men are refreshingly clear-eyed and candid, as you will see soon discover, which gives us the promise of a great conversation with Al Jazeera's Layla al-Sheikhli, a familiar face here in the region and beyond, Layla al Sheikhli is an Iraqi anchor woman and television presenter. Born in Baghdad, she lived in Saudi Arabia and was educated in England and the United States. Ms. al Sheikhli started her career in Washington, D.C., where she was a TV broadcaster. Later, she joined the BBC World Service in London and continued her journalistic work with several Arab satellite stations. She has interviewed some of the most prominent public figures of recent decades, among them Nelson Mandela, Muammar Gaddafi, and the late Lebanese Prime Minister Rafiq Hariri. In 2007, together with fellow Iraqi activist Hussein Mahmoud, Layla hosted A Day in the Life of Iraqi Women as an Every Woman special discussing the lives of Iraqi women under the US-led occupation. The first female presenter running a political program on Arab television, she is also an educator. Through courses offered by Al Jazeera Media Institute, Layla trains young people in media skills, TV news broadcasting, and talk show presentation. Please join me in welcoming to the stage our distinguished panelists, Ambassadors Davis and Wilkes, along with their moderator, Layla Al Sheikhli, and Ambassadors. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I was asked to speak a bit louder so everybody can hear us. Thank you so much, Dean uh, Masri, for the kind introduction. As an Iraqi American, this topic is very important to me. But then again, you don't have to be an Iraqi American to recognize that this is probably one of the most important, most uh, dramatic events of the 21st century. One that has changed the balance of power forever, probably, in this very, very strategic region. Yes, um, there was a regime that was changed, but at what price? Almost a million Iraqis were killed. Millions and billions of dollars were spent. A lot of destruction, a lot of chaos. And 20 years, we're still asking, why was Iraq invaded? Was it the answer to 9-11? And if it were the answer, who is responsible for what was committed? Some think tanks have called it uh, strategic mistakes. Even politicians, even politicians involved called it that. <laughs> After that, where's the accountability? Zero accountability for all the destruction that has taken place. And that's why it is so important to have a gathering like this, to ask questions. On the night of the invasion, March 
20th, 2003. I remember it very well because I was on air. And um, I was presenting a program called Ala Khat al Nar um, on Files Line uh, in Abu Dhabi television. And Hans Blix, who was in charge of finding the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, what happened to be our guest. It was not planned. And he actually, it wasn't planned to coincide with the bombing, I should say. The moment I introduced him, bombs started falling on Baghdad. I remember asking him, Mr. Blix, now that the war has started, is it justified? He paused. And all I could think of, my mind was racing. I said, please, please, Mr. Blix, please give us something different. Give us something we haven't heard. He didn't. Weapons of mass destruction, the Iraqi government wasn't cooperating. Years after, he did give us what I was hoping he would give us that night. But of course, he was out of office. And of course, there wasn't too much interest at that time. C'est la vie. That's how it is. Over the years, I've interviewed many decision makers, many politicians, diplomats. And I've learned that, of course, there are restrictions. There are diplomatic protocols that you know, don't allow people to say exactly what they feel at the time. And I've learned to respect that. And then they say it afterwards, OK, I have to, we have to acknowledge that. And I know that our guests today are in office. Both are ambassadors to the state of Qatar. And ambassadors, what we hope from you tonight is to get perhaps a perspective based on your personal experiences. I know you both served in Iraq in different capacities. We want to hear something that we don't really hear in mainstream media or, you know, we, we're really tired of hearing. Just something that helps us get an insight to what really took place and why. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, ambassadors. And Dean Mastri, I, uh, no pressure here, right? No pressure on the, none whatsoever, right? Yeah, I figured that. I figured you would agree. So uh, <laughs> I'm sure they can very, very well. I just want to uh, draw your attention to this barcode uh, on the tables in front of you. If you could please scan it and you can send any question you may have. Uh, and we will be happy to uh, address those questions at the end of the session. We'll try to take as many questions as we can. If you please keep them brief. Uh, and before we start the discussion, I understand there are some opening remarks by the ambassadors. Uh, so I will uh, ask you, Ambassador um, Davis, to please go ahead. Um, so I want to make sure, can folks hear me in the back? I want to make sure we're speaking at a good level for you. Um, so first, I want to thank uh, uh, Dean Masri, um, uh, he's correct that uh, we have a relationship, I have a relationship with Georgetown um, that I think uh, benefits both um, uh, me as ambassador but also the students uh, of Georgetown. Um, I will tell a quick story about why Georgetown is important to me and then uh, give a couple of remarks and we'll, um, and we'll move forward. When I was in Najaf um, in 2006, uh, I was the only civilian U.S. government official in Najaf. If you know uh, Najaf, you know it is um, uh, the holiest of places for Shia, right? Largest cemetery in the world is there. Um, and they sent a junior officer. I had been a Marine as part of the invasion force 18 months earlier. They sent a junior officer uh, to Najaf. Um, there were a couple of uh, U.S. Army uh, battalions around, one was leaving, another was coming. I went to see 
the advance party of the battalion that was coming. I, I, I met the EXO, met the executive officer. We had a great conversation. I was leaving to go on R&R &R for a few weeks, uh, but I knew that his unit would be there when I got back, and so we had a great conversation. And I said to him, I said, uh, yeah, I'm a foreign service officer. And he said, you went to Georgetown? And I said, well, all diplomats don't go to Georgetown. Um, and so uh, I told him I'd be right back. And uh, I went away for R&R, &R, and two days before I got back, he was killed. He was killed in a roadside bombing. And uh, I just remember sitting on the floor of my hooch, of my little trailer, crying um, and thinking, man, I, I, I wish I'd gone to Georgetown. I wish I'd been able to say yes to his question. And so the work that I do with Georgetown University is a, a personal debt uh, that I continue to try to pay. I was um, uniquely a US Marine as part of the invasion force. I told you I was in Najaf uh, a couple of years later, 05 to 07. I went to Basra for the first time in 2011, 2012, director for Iraq at the White House, counter ISIL with General Allen, back to Basra as the consul general. And so for whatever else my career has been, it has been about Iraq. I hope that we can get into your thought that there's been no accountability. Right, when I wake up in the middle of the night screaming, when I am curled up in the back of a bus, when I continue to go back to Iraq, President Saleh said earlier tonight, you can leave Iraq, but Iraq doesn't leave you. And the people in my life who've had to pay for the memory of every face of every young person who is dead because I convinced them to work with me and with the United States, the activists, the young women who were gunned down in the street in Basra after we closed the consulate, after I said we shouldn't close it, we closed it, right? After Iranian TV shows a picture of me and that young female activist and say she was killed because of Timmy Davis, the consul general. And so I challenge the notion that there's no accountability. I know the people who have paid the cost and the price. And so I'm excited to have this conversation. Um, I think it's an important one. Um, I don't know if you're gonna hear something that you've never heard before, maybe you just did. Um, but um, our responsibility to Iraq goes on and on. I've seen an evolution of political leaders in Iraq and how they think about the United States the, um, the excitement in the notion that the United States should leave from some Iraqi politicians 10 years ago has waned. Now it doesn't matter who the prime minister is, they understand that there needs to be a relationship with the United States, right? And I would emphasize something that President Saleh said uh, about how the region has changed, right? How our responsibility to each other has changed, how it has become an equal footing for countries in this region, our reparations, if you will, to Iraq cannot be about um, solving the problems of the past. It has to be about being a good partner now and into the future. And so that's my uh, chapeau and, uh, and I'll let, John is so happy that you said, um, we want to hear honesty. John, John's quitting in three months. <laughs> he, he can but say he whatever he post. can say whatever he wants. Not a different post. No, John, just completely. John's going to be out of this. John's going to tell all the truth. Okay. You can stand this mostly about me. <laughs> this is our chance. Well, uh, thanks, Sui. thanks, Leila. Thanks, uh, Dean Safwan Mashri. Thanks, uh, President Baham Saleh. Uh, and everybody who's come together tonight for you know, what is already going to be a very special and memorable occasion. This is not the first time I've been on stage debating these issues, but I can already feel this is going to be a very, very special, I think very valuable and very memorable uh, occasion. So um, I think I can give you what you want in the sense that um, I spent, I had no connection with the Middle East before I joined the Foreign Service. By coincidence, uh, by luck, I was put in the Middle East Department on the Iran desk and then offered the chance to learn Arabic. And since then, I've, I've specialized uh, with a passion for the region. But I think a bit like Timmy and indeed many friends in the uh, UK uh, and uh, US diplomatic services, uh, militaries, 
Uh, I've done more in and on Iraq than anything else in my 34 years of, of service. And I, I always want to share what I knew and what I saw, because I think this is a testimony that is, uh, uh, is valuable as we plot uh, our way forward. You talked about the question of accountability, and very often people want to talk about international law. And I think that debate has, the experts who've been engaged in that debate, I think, have uh, laid out all the arguments for and against. I think that's very clear. I would say from my uh, um, uh, perspective, uh, I did three postings in Iraq. So opening the embassy after the war in 2003, deputy ambassador 2009-10, and I was ambassador just recently 2017-19. to But I was actually an intelligence analyst in the run-up to the war back in London. Not looking at the issue of WMD, but the team that was looking at WMDs was sat uh, sat next to me. The one thing I can say is, you know, I can share a lot of you know the things that I know and saw. The reason I can do that, it is all out there. I mean, the UK has done so many inquiries. I mean, in that's that sense, we have done more accountability than anybody else. Uh, all the facts are out there. All the documents are, uh, are out there. So I think I can give you what you want because you can ask me questions where I'm not betraying secrets because it's it's all in the uh, in the documents. I'll finish by saying um, uh, the Middle East. Very often, uh, people use the term. You know, it, it gets you, you. You catch the bug. But I think Iraq does that for people as well. Uh, it has done for me. I'm part of a network of people in. Uh, Iraq, Iraqi diaspora communities in the UK and the US and many other countries who have all served together in Iraq. Uh, we remain connected with Iraq. We want to uh, be a part of what President Barham Saleh talked about, that after 20 years, there is enough that is moving in the right direction, never to give up hope, despite the many challenges. Uh, and one thing uh, uh, President Barham Saleh reminded me is we have sessions like this in Baghdad. When I was in my final couple of months in 2019, about four months ago. Um, and as many of you will know, I speak Arabic, so I could do these sessions in Arabic uh, or, or English. Uh, we would have discussions and debates about uh, many of the fundamental issues, you know, presidential system versus prime ministerial system, how to be uh, uh, authentic to Iraq's Islamic roots while also uh, respecting the diversity of Iraqi society, how to, how to make the most of Iraq's due uh, graphical uh, position, um, how to deal with this growing environmental crisis, which gets worse year on year, and which now, as President Barham Saleh says, is, is getting critical. The quality of those conversations from the Iraqi uh, participants and uh, partners in the room was something I have never experienced in any other country, and gives me hope that we have enough people who care, who have capabilities, uh, who have the ability to lead and to manage uh, both in the private and public sector, uh, what will be needed to give Iraq the future uh, it deserves. And if tonight's debate can be a little contribution to that, whether that's looking back at the lessons learnt and the practicing of self-criticism and reflection, or the looking forward to what we learnt that can help us make the next 20 years better than the last 20 years, I think it'll be time well spent for all of us. Probably, I don't know if you agree, but they're both linked yeah. because being able to look forward has a lot to do with looking back. Uh, and um, that's what, but by the way, your opening remarks have led me to just change the whole scenario that I had planned for this uh, interview. So I'm going to start uh, at a different place completely. And allow me, please, I reserve the right to counter challenge the accountability part. Please. Okay. Now, Ambassador, I want to ask you about what was known. How and when was the decision to invade Iraq made? How long or short after 9-11? I have no idea, right? <laughs> I, 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 was, uh, I was a US Marine. After 9-11, I got on a ship. We went to the Horn of Africa. We uh, went to Afghanistan. We came home. Uh, we were home for a short time. We were told to start working up. Um, at some point in early 2003 or late 2002, we got back on the ship and we headed to this uh, region, right? And we sort of floated around for a while. And then um, in uh, March of 2003, on the night that you speak of, 
um, uh, the uh, aircraft and helicopters and personnel from my ship um, went to Iraq? Um, it's a great question. It's not one that I'm privy to. When, when, you, um, when you talk about reflecting on the impact of that decision and why that decision was made, uh, John's um, uh, great nation is not the only nation that's done uh, what we like to call navel gazing. Uh, the United States has had a rich and robust conversation. Uh, careers uh, of politicians who sought higher office um, have been uh, slowed down and impacted by their voting yes uh, for that war. Everyone, in fact, everyone was held accountable. One of the reasons that Hillary Clinton didn't become president in 2008 is because Barack Obama had not voted for the Iraq war, right? And so when we talk about accountability, it's not a bumper sticker, right? It's not a slogan. Okay. People's lives were impacted. Their political futures were impacted by where they came down on the war in Iraq. Okay. And, and if, I, if I just could, 20 years later, my not having been a politician and having been sent to Najaf, I had to make a decision on the ground as all of us did Am I gonna be a person who cares about whether there were WMD and someone in Washington made a decision about whether they were gonna um, invade a country, or am I gonna wake up every day and risk my life to try to help the people of Najaf, right? And so it's not a monolith. Some politicians made decisions as they do in Iraq, and then a whole bunch of us left our families and our homes and risked our lives to help Iraqis. Exactly why we need to know why those politicians decide to do that. And the reason I'm asking the question about the timing is because there have been a lot of literature saying that the actual decision to invade Iraq was taken shortly after, actually days after 9-11. However, the narrative regarding the WMDs was presented much later. Uh, we never forget the famous Colin Powell speech where he told the world that you know, WMDs existed and that we need to, that Iraq was a threat, was a big threat to the world. Before that, Secretary Ramsfeld actually went out of his way to say that we know exactly the location of these WMDs. Four years earlier, Scott Ritter, on record, said Iraq had, was posted no threat whatsoever, zero threat. Yet, I, I, I have to ask this question. Why did the American politicians choose to make those remarks? Was it that they were misinformed? Or they deliberately lied to us all? OK, to me. Listen, I, are we, I want to know if we're going to talk about Sykes-Pico or not. <laughs> to me, could I just want you to think about it? Can I, can I you know, fulfill my commitments to tell you what it looked like from my point of view, because I can say things about the two questions please, you posed. Please. So this is from a British perspective and is what has been published in the British inquiries, okay? So I have no inside knowledge to the exact decisions made on which day and which hour in the US system. But I had volunteered along with many people in the UK system to man the embassy in Afghanistan in 2002 after the fall of the Taliban until we set that embassy up. And it was in the summer of 2002, without me as then as a mid-ranking diplomat, I was the deputy head of mission there, uh, it's, you could see that there was definitely an intent had crystallized by that summer, uh, that Iraq was a problem that needed solving. And it's important to recognize, you're focusing on the international law aspects and the WMD, it's important to recognize there was a lot of pressure on US, UK politicians, the UN, about the state of Iraq because of sanctions which had been on uh, Iraq since the 1991. So this was a file that was, whatever the debates after 9-11, it was a file that was already developing through the 90s about sanctions were not leading to anything other than the impoverishment of the 
uh, of the people of Iraq and the regime was escaping, uh, Saddam Hussein regime was escaping that. That's one. The second thing is, I told you I was an intelligence analyst about Iraq, uh, the state of Iraq, uh, but I was in the room next door to the guys who were doing the WMD intelligence. And again, this is all out there in public, okay? So this is not me revealing anything that's just you know, drawing attention to the answer to your question. And that is not just the US and the UK, but Russia and France uh, all thought that, according to the intelligence information they had, that Saddam Hussein had the intent to restore his WMD programs, and there was a small amount of, of uh, WMD that he could uh, choose to, to build on. And the difference, the political difference of opinion was, was that itself justification? What were the threat levels, what were the thresholds that a country would be prepared to, to tolerate? And, uh, and as Timmy and I and everybody else remembers at that time, the US thresholds changed dramatically after 9-11. Uh, and I think all that's out there, and I think that gives you the answer to the questions you have asked. I, I would, I would also point out that if uh, my ha not having been part of any of those political decisions, if what is needed to reflect on the last two decades of what's happened in Iraq is for someone to say there were no WMD, there were no WMD. I think it does a disservice to the Iraqis I know and love. It does a disservice to the young people who keep showing up to vote. It does a disservice to the people in 2019 who showed up in the street. For the focus in a conversation about the last 20 years to be about relitigating a conversation, a debate that is over. And, yes. and if, I'm, if I might. Yes. And yes. almost inconsequential to what happened for most of the last 20 years, right? Yes. Corrupt, corrupt politicians, Iranian-influenced militias, ISIS, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna spend the 30 minutes we have allotted for this relitigating whether they were WMD or not and not talk about the things, the things that hurt Iraqis on a daily basis. Ambassador Davis, that cannot be inconsequential for a million Iraqis that lost their lives. I, 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 I am sure, I'm sure you dis you agree with that. But let me just, just so, let me, just no, let me ask. No, let's be, let's let, be, wait we a second. Get back you to this. wanted a heated debate. This is what you got. <laughs> okay. Let's be clear. When I say inconsequential, I mean sitting here on this stage asking this question over and over again, thinking that I'm somehow gonna have knowledge about those political decisions. The initiation of the war, not inconsequential. Okay. The Iraqis point, who died, not inconsequential. The Americans point, who died, not uh, inconsequential. You made your point, however, the problem is we don't have answers to those questions 20 years later. But I want to ask uh, uh, Ambassador Wilkes, you mentioned, um, the decision to go ahead with this war, even though there wasn't really um, the laws behind it that actually, actually uh, um, Secretary of State or Foreign Minister Jack Straw, on the eve of the war, wrote a private letter to Tony Blair warning him that this war was not, Ill, uh, uh, not um, it was illegally dubious, correct? So Leila, you have all the answers. Everybody in this room has the answers. It's all been published. You're quoting from no, published no, no, material. No, but it's important so, to make... So, so wait there. Uh, let me so, just... so wait there. I will give you added value of what I know. Yes, yes. But it's all out there. Yes. And it was all out there a but decade I ago. I didn't ask my question. And what I would like to say is, Timmy's got a point that what you... Oh, okay. Let me, let me say that we're on the international law question, which I regularly debate on stage, yes. okay? The next question, set of questions, will be about, okay, so we've had the law debate, which is different views among the experts. It'll then be, was it a strategic mistake, will be the next set of questions, okay? You know, when we look at the consequences, can America look at, you know, the positives and the negatives? And you may ask the same about the UK. And these debates are all very well, but we have been having them for 20 yes. years. However... It's very important for us to understand today why Britain, having all the writing on the wall, decided to go ahead and support uh, George Bush, or I should say, why did Tony Blair decide to do it? 
to yeah. support him and go ahead, although it, France said we will absolutely be it, we will veto this if this goes ahead, yet it went ahead. So you're right, it was about Tony Blair's decision, and he's talked about it, and it really goes back to everything President Barham Saleh said. He has said, I would do it again to get rid of a regime like Saddam Hussein's because of everything, as President Barham Saleh said, that had happened under that uh, regime. So that was his, in his mind, that is the, the justification for it. And so one of the reasons why it's difficult with the international law debate is you were dealing with a regime that had done so much to break international law that politically it doesn't hit home. Now, of course, experts will debate the pros and cons of international law and the meaning of the precedents. But actually, George Bush and Tony Blair got re-elected, despite the fact when they were re-elected, though the, a lot of the negative consequences of the war had become clear. And it's because, in the end, the American public and the British public, I think, knew that it was very difficult to make an international argument when you're talking about the Saddam Hussein regime. Yeah. It's interesting because seven years ago, I watched Tony Blair in the wakes of uh, the Chilcot report talk about what this meant to him. I just want to quote it. I don't want to make a mistake on saying exactly what he said. He said, I expressed more sorrow, regret, and apology than you can ever know and believe. His chief advisor, whom I'm sure you know very well, Alistair Campbell, said, the Iraq issue will haunt Blair until his death. Ambassador, I know you speak Arabic. In Arabic, we, we have a phrase. Bad kharab al Basra. This comes after, you know, all this devastation. Okay. I have no doubt of the sincerity because I watched that video so many times and I could see uh, the ambassador, he, he's genuinely and sincerely feeling the, the pain of people who have lost their lives in this war. But the question is, where do the Iraqis go to find justice after all these years? You will say, okay, this is behind us, let's, let's move on. But you can't move on when you've lost so many lives, when so, you've lost so much. You have to have closure. And the closure comes with accountability. Yes. Now, of course, now you're talking about something slightly different, which is how does Iraqi society heal after everything? Okay, after the last 20 years, after the Saddam Hussein regime, after everything uh, since the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. And that, of course, is a question that is debated in Iraq. The debate around, you know, due to a South Africa style system, a Northern Ireland style system, looking at different models about how Iraqi society heals. That is a debate which is going on in uh, se uh, sessions like this in Baghdad, and I took part in that. And as you know, there are uh, special envoys of, uh, 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 of the UN and some of the international courts who are working on these, these issues. So that is a different question and a very valid question of how does Iraqi society heal. And now I think those issues are on the table internationally with the Iraqis in the lead deciding what is the best way to do it. Ambassador Davis, would you agree that some closure is needed, that you can't just move on and say, okay, let's put it behind us, that we need to see somebody held accountable, some sanctions at least. For example, till this day, Germany is paying the price for World War I, correct? When Russia invaded Ukraine, everybody, you know, raised the red flag we need to impose sanctions on Russia. And they were, very quickly, I may add. Yet, now, with so many people coming forward, amongst them Tony Blair, even George Bush with the blunder, we all know the Freudian slip he had recently when he was uh, talking about um, the Ukraine war, war and he accidentally said Iraq. 
after all this, yet nobody has been accounted for what had happened and so that people can move forward, can say, okay, I, I think we I have closure. I think I misunderstand what you mean by accountability. Yeah, maybe What, maybe what is accountability where, for you? Yes, for somebody, you know, rather than like, for example, Tony Blair being knighted by the late Queen can I, Elizabeth. Can I just say something here? I really, I mean, you say Tony Blair expresses remorse and regret yes. for all the death and all the destruction, which basically means you're saying he's a normal human being. Yes. As if it's some great revelation of evil. What are you trying to get at? By the way, every politician I've ever served under in 34 years has always found the decisions about deployment of military forces, for whatever reason, the most difficult uh, decisions. And so not one of them has not felt Tell me how some many decisions have cost a million lives. How many decisions have cost destruction of a country? How many decisions have cost a social, you know, a network, a social, just being ripped apart in a country. So that would be the counter question. So you're now saying that the history of Iraq is a history of much violence and much crisis, of which the last 20 years, as President Baham Saleh said, was one chapter, but we have chapters before that. And you are right to say, how does a country that has such fantastic, talented people, huge natural resources, great agricultural resources, but also this history that is pretty unique in the region, though not as bad as, the, as again, President Baham Saleh said about the history of continental Europe, where the levels of violence and death and destruction in that same period of history were worse. How do we get this great country onto a better trajectory? And you're right to pose that question. But you can't pose it by saying, as long as we settle the US and the UK side of this equation, that's done. Then we can then proceed in a way we can't proceed if we don't take it in that uh, direction. I, so I think- Maybe I, it's I, not as simple me, as that. Let me just finish. I think it is very easy, and by the way, a lot of Iraqis spend a lot of time doing this, taking a position against you know, whoever it is that they would hold primarily responsible. Some will say US and UK. These days, some people will say Iran. Some people will say Turkey. Some people will say uh, internal uh, political and armed forces. It is important, I think, when looking at Iraqi history, when coming to terms with, as you put it, all the decisions that led to death and destruction, to then come out with some sort of practical idea about how we move forward. And I think that's really, really essential because what, again, President Baham Saleh said, which I saw in 2003, we were dealing with, and the, the Iraqi diaspora, the expats were the ones who, who were most shocked by it. We were dealing with a society that was coming out of a trauma. It then had further traumas to go, but we were dealing with something that I think has to be seen in the round, and I think it has to come into a debate about truth and reconciliation accountability that has to take into account all. And probably, given the lessons we've had, as I said, I mentioned some other examples, um, you're not gonna move forward quickly if you try and litigate every single aspect of history from the last 100 years. If I, and if, I'm sorry, if I, if, if, if I could say just a couple of things. First, you've done something extraordinary, which is to get John and I to agree about <laughs> the last 20 years. Um, I, I think it absolutely defies critical thinking to say that there was one decision to invade and it cost a million lives. It is, the, it is doing addition and subtraction when it is calculus, right? You can question the decision about the invasion, but if you're gonna do that, if we're gonna have a real conversation, then you've gotta talk about Iranian influence. You've gotta talk about corrupt politicians. You've gotta talk about parties that had militias in Iraq uh, well before uh, the troubles of the last 10 years with regard to Shia militias. The idea that there was a decision and then a million people died Right, what you lament is that there was 9-11 and the United States overreacted, but it wasn't the case that there was a decision and a million people died. There was a decision and then real human beings made really bad 
decisions for the Iraqi people. And so I reject the notion that there was a decision and a million Iraqis died. It's much more complicated and complex than that. It's the conversation I would prefer to have, but if we're not gonna have that conversation, I wanna say out loud that the last 20 years in Iraq will be studied for the next 200 years and not just for a decision that George Bush made. Okay, let's try and, and see where we can talk about the lessons learned. What, in your opinion, is the most important lesson in these last 20 years for everybody, for both sides? Okay, so I'll, I'll give you my answer to that. Please. So I think the debate in, in the UK and US and Western circles was around these military interventions in Afghanistan and Iraq and uh, what should be the main lessons learned for any future decisions that were made. And some people will say, just never again. Okay, they will have come to that conclusion and they will analyze it. Others will say, you, know, you have to actually look at specific uh, criteria. And for me, the, the main criterion, the main political criterion is look at your partners on the ground, okay? Uh, they may be opposition diaspora, they may be uh, on the ground in the country or working with the people of the country and the political groupings. Uh, and how strong and capable are they? And what's your relationship with them? How strong is that relationship? How, how much does the interests of the people on the ground overlap with the interests of your uh, country? If you can say that both answers to these questions of the quality and the strength and capability of the political forces on the ground you are partnering with and your relationship with them are both strong, then I think you can justify um, uh, uh, interventions. Um, and when I think about the experience I had in Iraq in 2003 uh, and afterwards three or four times on postings there, I think the partners on the ground that could have delivered success, uh, and obviously President Baram Saleh spoke about this, are those who are basically Iraqi nationalists, uh, Nurid Watan, which was a sentiment very strongly uh, expressed. And that anybody who uh, uh, um, attempts to pursue an agenda that's essentially going to divide Iraq, and that could be an Islamic state agenda, Sunni or Shia, it could be Kurdish nationalism, uh, it could be people who just didn't care about uh, the future of the country and all its people. They just wanted to pursue their own interests. Those were not partners for us. And I think we probably put too much weight on some of our partnerships with people who uh, fitted into those categories. And I think that is the lesson I would draw if I, uh, I was involved in the decision making uh, in a future scenario like this. And the hopeful point, and I absolutely support what President Baram Saleh said, is the majority of Iraqis were and remain what are you? you know, whatever their background, religious and ethnic and regional and uh, ideological, uh, I think all of them see that the penalty and price that Iraq has to pay, if we say divided, as opposed to a basic level of working together for Iraq as a common homeland, uh, this bridge between the neighboring countries, ability to partner with all the big countries, because there's no question that Iraq can build relationships not just with the US and UK but with many countries that oppose the, the war. The prize is too great not to let that majority actually uh, drive the next 20 years. Uh, now not everybody who has power in Iraq uh, believes in Iraq as a country and believes in all Iraqis but the majority do uh, and you know my personal uh, reflection on my time there is that, I think, has been the thing that's impressed itself on me most about knowing Iraqis and living in Iraq and working in Iraq, that that sense of uh, Iraqi identity has not been lost, and on that majority can be built a better future. I obviously agree with everything that John has said. I, it's interesting. It's such an interesting question of what the biggest lesson learned is. And, 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 and here's, what I, here's what I think it is, and I will give you a little bit. We shouldn't be oppositional uh, completely uh, this evening. Um, we have made mistakes in Iraq. For me, the biggest mistake we made is in not listening to Iraqis. Iraqis have gone to the polls over and over and over again. 
And sometimes uh, we and our partners have thought we knew better, right? We knew we had a plan, we're heading in a direction, Iraqis went to the polls, they voted in a way that wasn't in the direction that we wanted to go, and uh, maybe we didn't give enough support, maybe we supported another, um, another uh, angle. But the truth is, uh, in my opinion, that um, the mistake that we, the greatest mistake we made was when the Iraqi people used their voice and said what they wanted, we did not fully support it and then work with whomever they chose, right? Government formation in Iraq has been uh, maybe one of the most fascinating political things I've seen in my life. And we have been part of it and not part of it. We likely, and not just the United States, but our partners as well, should have carried out the will of the Iraqi people and figured out a way to work with whomever they chose to represent them. Because the results of elections in Iraq have always been about being Iraqi, have always been nationalist. There has not been one vote, one national election in Iraq where they voted against their own interests as Iraqis. And we should have been supporting that from, from day one. Um, and so for me, that's the biggest lesson and one that I'll take with me in my diplomatic career about understanding that when people are speaking about their own interests, when people are voting, people are risking their lives to go to polls, whatever that return is, whatever that outcome is, our responsibility should be to work with whomever people have democratically elected if we believe in democracy, and then finding a way forward as partners. Um. Maybe, could I just add, I was there for the 2010 elections. Okay. This is the example that I think really illustrates what uh, Tim has just said. And, uh, of course, uh, those elections were won by a list that could credibly claim to be an Iraqi national uh, list. It was uh, a Sunni Shia, secular uh, Islamist, uh, and it roughly came ahead in the vote ahead of uh, uh, the list that was headed by, by Nouri al-Maliki. Uh, and it was that point, and I remember talking to many Iraqis, you know, this is a vote for change. Doesn't mean that the winning list would get all the power in the executive, but this was a vote for change. And then for one reason or another, of course, the change at that point did not happen. Uh, and you can link that then ultimately to the uh, 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 conflict with uh, Daesh in 2014. But I think it, for me, it's the illustration that there was a strong enough sense of Iraqi nationalism and a wanting to change politics that all of Iraq could decide its future for the benefit of all its people. I must say, I was looking for something different that I hadn't for, uh, heard before. And I, I, I think we did hear something from uh, two diplomats who are in office. And thank you so much for talking candidly to us. I have a million questions still, but I, I guess this is not the place. However, I want to leave a, a chance to the people here uh, to ask uh, some questions. We'll, we'll make it very quick because I understand the dessert is waiting. How much time do we? I think this is more important than dessert. Okay, wait, okay. Wait, wait a second, let me, <laughs> let me tell you all something. Dean Mossery is so put out when I come to Georgetown, he's like, let's do this for an hour and then two hours into it, I see him going like this and he's like, <laughs> But here tonight at his own event, he's perfectly fine for, for us to stick around. I always want to spend as much time as I can. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. OK. Uh, I'm going to take a question by Ayman Mohyuddin, MSNBC. The Biden administration has said it would help Ukrainians in their pursuit of justice in the International Criminal Court of Alleged War Crimes by Russian officials. Do you believe Iraqi families have the right to pursue justice against the US officials involved in Iraq, in the Iraq war, in the same form? And who's, who do you want? I mean, who do you want to answer that? <laughs> I had to get that. John? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, uh, Eamon, listen, I, you know, my follow-up question would be, how far down do those officials go, right? Am I one of those officials for being part of the invasion force? Am I one of those officials for being in Najaf for 18 months and making a lot of decisions 
Am I one of those officials for not being able to keep the consulate open in Basra? I would say, you know, uh, we have a, a system in the United States that allows people to um, uh, seek redress and sue for whatever they want to sue for. Uh, the truth is, I think that um, if someone has been involved in a, a, a violation to themselves or violence to themselves, if they would like to sue, they should be able to sue. I do think, however, uh, that uh, we drift into a conversation about theory when we're talking about individuals who are part of a conflict suing uh, the country that um, that caused the the conflict. I don't think I don't think there's a winning strategy there, but I certainly don't have a problem with it. It's important, I think, that you all know that uh, I want everything good for Iraqis from Erbil to Basra, right? I want everything good for them. I want them and their children to have lives that are prosperous. Uh, when I floated on the marshes when I was in Basra and saw the, the what was left of the lives of the people who used to live in those marshes, when President Baram Saleh talks about um, the salt wedge coming in from the Gulf, the Shad al-Arab and the inability of a part of Iraq in the South that used to be the Garden of Eden, used to be green and lush um, uh, and seeing those changes. I want that bright future for all Iraqis, individual Iraqis that want to pursue that future uh, in that way, in a legal or litigious way, okay. Right, they have more than earned the right to seek the future that they want, and if uh, suing uh, the U.S. government is uh, part of that, um, while I don't think it's practical, um, I would never say that people shouldn't do what they think will um, uh, secure their future. And as far as Britain's concerned, some Iraqis have pursued uh, cases in the course of so the answer is yes, they have that right. It's actually quite a complicated legal question about. Uh, uh, um, extraterritoriality, but the, in principle, yes, that can. Yes, there have uh, been that, cases. Uh, have been cases. Thank you, Ayman, for that question. There's another question by Adnan. Uh, I'll, uh, um, if you could answer it, uh, Ambassador Wilkes. How has the Iraq invasion influenced your country's foreign policy and approach to intervention and other? So I think that's, that's a very good question. I think generally among political elites, uh, extreme. Um, uh, skepticism verging on opposition to doing this. Uh, obviously, the Iraq war was divisive in both the US and the UK, both in uh, among politicians and among uh, public opinion. And I think those politicians, I'm, Barack Obama is one of them, uh, uh, the uh, politicians who had opposed the, uh, the war uh, in the UK, uh, I think they made foreign policy arguments thereafter about you know, extreme caution, skepticism. Not so many took a pacifist position of never, ever, under any circumstances. Um, uh, but I think that has had an influence. Uh, and I think it influenced policy on uh, Syria um, and, uh, uh, and continues to influence our, our policy uh, debates. But I think what also is the case is that for many of our politicians who were involved with Iraq uh, before uh, 2003 and became or stayed involved after 2003, uh, they very uh, uh, quickly, I think, saw that there was a possibility to improve the situation as it was on the ground and would have met politicians like Baham Saleh and others with whom they could, could partner. So there is also, I think, because remember, Iraq was a black box for the UK and the US and many countries for the 10 or so years of sanctions. We didn't have embassies, we lost contacts, we had a growing diaspora community, but they too very often lost contacts. And suddenly we came back into a country where we could rebuild connections and knowledge, including through our diaspora communities. So there is also this very positive restoration of relations with a country that we are connected to. There's a very strong human bridge between the UK and Iraq. Uh, it is not where it is with the Gulf states, but it is on the way to being so. And I think most Iraqis, um, whatever the history, going back 100 years, let alone 20 years, would say uh, we don't want to rule out partnerships in Iraq's interest with any country. 
Yeah, I mean, listen, I think that's a good question for the United States as well. I, I would point out that there are very few instances prior to 2003 where the United States um, uh, got into uh, a conflict in the way that it got into one in Iraq, and very few instances after 2003. Um, you can uh, look, and John rightly points out, uh, in Syria uh, and with uh, President Obama, um, um, he certainly uh, was cautious about uh, what to do and whether to intervene. Um, I think a lot of the lessons learned uh, from Iraq uh, revolve, at least for politicians, revolve around the idea that you will be defined by this, by this decision. Um, uh, but further, I, and I can't speak for the military in the UK, uh, but the US military is not clamoring um, to be part of any sort of conflict where there's not a clear defined goal, um, where there isn't a clear whole of government or interagency, uh, at least on the US side, um, uh, uh, understanding of what it is we are going to do. Uh, what the uh, Iraq war did to the inside of the US government is, is fascinating. Right, the military started doing diplomacy. They had more money than the State Department did. Um, and so I know in Najaf, um, the work that I was doing was because of my charm and good looks. Um, but the US military showed up and they were just, they had all of this cash. Um, and so um, it's changed the way the US government works and does um, even development, uh, the Iraq war. Um, and so I think there's just a great sort of cautiousness about what we get ourselves into because of its impact um, and sometimes corrosive, corrosive uh, effect on, uh, on, our, on, our, on our government and our country. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador Davis. Thank you very much, Ambassador uh, Wilkes. And uh, thank you all. I think it's so healthy to have debates like these. I know I might have uh, ruffled some feathers here, but believe it or not, it was done on purpose because I really wanted to hear something different. So thank you so much. Well done, thank you so thank much. You. And, and thanks. thanks. I really want to see what happens for a second. What I can say is, <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, today at lunch is having conversation with uh, some of our guests uh, from the U.S. Ayman, uh, Juan Cole, Vali Nasser, uh, the provost was there, and I can't remember who else was part of the conversation. And the um, the question I was being asked was, you know, there's been nothing like what you're planning for this conference that's been curated in Washington or Philadelphia or New York or London uh, for that matter. Uh, you know, there's been nothing. There's been very, very little and nobody sort of, you know, from the administration has been commenting um, on the occasion of the uh, 20th, uh, 20th year administration. And I think, I mean, not only could this conversation not take place there, it had to take place here. Um, there's no way it could have taken place there, right? And so the other question I was being asked is, how did you get the ambassadors to agree to do this, right? And I think now I and the people who were asking me can appreciate why <laughs> um, it would have been, uh, you know, that it really is a huge extension of yourselves to present yourselves to us here tonight. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, this was a, a tense at times um, conversation and discussion, a difficult one, and I think uh, also difficult for uh, even, you know, Leila as a moderator, because you want to ask important questions, and, and you know that the answers are not going to lie with one individual or with two individuals. And so I'm grateful, we're all grateful, not only for having this conversation um, for, for Leila um, hosting it and moderating it, but for you, um, Timmy and John, for making yourselves available, for engaging in it, for, um, you know, being put in a tough position because, you know, you're not, 
you're not responsible for the war, right? If anything, I mean, I recall in one of the very early, and I know I'm standing between you and dessert, so I, I will try to be brief. Uh, but one of the things that struck me about Ambassador Davis when I first met him was how he kept talking about his experience in Iraq and how he would get teary-eyed in narrating some of the episodes, some of the anecdotes, some of the things that he encountered there. And I don't know if you recall this, but in one conversation I asked you, what would you want to do you know, after Qatar? What do you see as your trajectory? And I'm paraphrasing here, so forgive me if I don't narrate it uh, accurately. But what I understood from you was, you want to go back to Iraq. You want to go back because you feel you owe it to the people that you came across, to the people whose lives were lost. Um, I felt a genuine sort of pull to to do something and to try to do something that is positive. Um, and by the way, just to correct, you know, for the record, Ambassador Davis came to join me and students for iftar in Ramadan. Okay, iftar was at like 5.45. And I was asked to participate in another event, to speak at an event. And I said, what time? And they said, 8.30. I said, sure, 8.30. You know, iftar is at 5.45. But Ambassador Davis was enjoying the conversation with the students so much. You get tired of their company? Never, but I wasn't getting tired. Patty, I need your help here, okay? I'm never going to live past this. Always enjoy your company, Timmy. Um, and John, um, you know, you're... Your, your very sophisticated analysis and answers uh, are incredibly appreciated. And, um, you know, I think with both of you, with John, I mean, you know, we saw it tonight, sort of the, the, the balance and the intersection of the diplomatic but genuine skill and the intellectual heft that you bring to the conversation um, is so incredibly uh, helpful and it was so much appreciated. So when I answer the question, I'm sure Timmy feels the same way. Why did we put ourselves out here? Because we care. Right. Yeah, you do, right. you do, yeah. you do. Yeah, and that's what I was trying to get to. You care and you care deeply and I know uh, those were very difficult years. Those were very difficult years because ultimately you know, you put aside your titles, you put aside the offices that you hold, you are human beings, you are empathetic, you are deeply caring, and you are people I've grown in the past few months that I've known you to greatly admire and be fond of. And uh, I can appreciate how difficult this has been for you and how difficult it is also when um, you probably constantly put on the spot to try to explain things that you don't, as, 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 as you said to me, you don't know, you don't have the answers. Um, so this was great and thank you. I can't thank you enough for doing this. I can't thank you enough, President Saleh, for doing this and, for, and Peter. There's so many people to thank, but I will do my thanks at the end of the conference on Saturday afternoon because you're coming back tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning, we have breakfast with Ayman, Ayman Muhyiddin, um, the, the celebrated anchorman from, and, and journalist and, and host, host, not anchorman, from MSNBC. He was uh, our commencement speaker, as I mentioned earlier. Um, this past uh, May, and I told him no good deed ever goes unpunished. So he was so great that he's back here again and again. People I mentioned earlier, Bali Nasser, Juan Cole, um, Sam Yanahul, uh, uh, Lale is uh, here from Exeter, and we'll be hearing from you. We'll be hearing from some of our own um, faculty, Gerd Noneman and uh, Mehran uh, Kamrana and Ed Eddie Kola and, 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 and CU Floyd. And so it's going to be a, a great course. As I was explaining to somebody who was interviewing me from um, one of the media outlets here today, the value to our students, and I see a number of students here, students enroll in a class and they learn from one professor. And if they're lucky, they learn a lot. Here, we all have an opportunity to learn from 
you know, 30, 40 professors, and they're not all academic professors, right? So there is great value in that. Uh, I do want to thank our provost for really having made the effort to be with us. Uh, I mean, he is host and guest. Uh, he is the provost of Georgetown University, and he made the effort to be with us for this. So thank you very much, Bob. Um, there are many, many people to thank. As I said, I'll thank them at the end. But Zahra, thank you.